We're in a series, actually finishing up our series called For a Change. It's about the fact that although God is unchanging, He's always moving to change us and through us to change the world. So far we've talked about follow for a change or follow for a change. You can say this two ways. Pray for a change. Serve for a change. Today the word is stop. Stop for a change or stop for a change. Because here's the thing, if we are going to let God change us and through us change others, instead of resisting and avoiding interruptions, we actually need to learn how to stop and embrace the interruptions that God brings our way. Everything we've talked about so far over the last few weeks requires us to stop in, in one way or another. You want to join God in His mission by serving? Well, you probably have to stop doing something else so that you can start stepping into what He has for you, the work that He has for you to do. You want to learn how to connect with God through prayer? Well, guess what? You're going to have to stop long enough to be quiet and listen with your heart and your mind. You want to learn how to follow Jesus and experience His life? You will have to stop and make time to learn. Following Jesus always entails stopping at various moments of our lives. And what I want to talk about today is stopping when God interrupts us. The great theologian and Nazi resistance pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a book called Life Together, and this is what he writes. We must be ready to allow ourselves to be interrupted by God. We must allow ourselves to be ready to be interrupted by God. God will be constantly crossing our paths and canceling our plans by saying us people with claims and petitions. We may pass by them preoccupied with our more important tasks. It is a strange fact that Christians and even ministers frequently consider their work so important and urgent that they will allow nothing to disturb them. They think they are doing God a service in this, but actually they are disdaining God's crooked yet straight path. And I love that picture, God's crooked yet straight path. As you, and in the course of following Jesus, you are going to go all over the place because God takes you where He wants you to be as we move forward together. So let's talk about what it's like to stop. I want to go to one of the most famous passages in Scripture. This is Jesus, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, starting verse 25. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, Well, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and... Love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this and you will live. All right, so here's Jesus teaching, as usually as a crowd of people around him, and he encounters this expert in religious law. This was actually a lawyer who specialized in Old Testament law. And, and these religious teachers, like this guy before Jesus, they were respected community leaders. Everyone assumed that these leaders, these lawyers, religious lawyers, were just a little bit closer to God than everyone else. And frankly, at least according to what we see in the New Testament, so did they. <laughs> the lawyers figured they were a little closer to God. And so when Jesus showed up, it messed with their world because he came with a different interpretation of the law and what it meant to know God. And he was most definitely not part of the establishment, and yet he was very popular. And so as a result, they were very jealous. So here comes this religious lawyer in verse 25, and he stood up to test Jesus. In other words, he asked him a question, hoping to trip him up, embarrass him in public, not like, say, a reporter with a presidential candidate asking a question with a hidden agenda, trying to make him look bad in public, right? Jesus, he says, how do you enter God's kingdom? Now, Jesus, of course, knows exactly what the man is up to. And so in typical rabbinic fashion, he throws the question back at him. He says, well, how does the law of Moses read? Well, you're the expert. You tell me. And so the lawyer gives him the standard line. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, yes, you got it. And then he goes in for the kill. <laughs> he says, go live that way. Live that out, because it's one thing to know it, it's another 
to do it. And the lawyer is not living that way because look how he responds at verse 20. The man wanted to justify his actions. In other words, he's not living this way. He knows it. And so he starts looking for a loophole. And so he asked Jesus, well, and, and who's my neighbor? Jesus, to define neighbor. I mean, technically, how do you really know if someone's your neighbor or not? Who, who's my neighbor? Technically. And so in response, Jesus tells what may be his most famous parable in all of the New Testament, but I invite you as we read it to hear it with new ears and fresh, fresh ears today. Verse 30, Jesus replied with the story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant, also known as a Levite, walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Let's stop for just a moment here and look at the cast in Jesus' little drama here. We got a group of bandits who would attack a man, they beat the snot out of him, and they leave him for dead, all right? And then through the three main characters, first comes by a priest. Now, Jewish priests were very important. They were highly honored because they were the bridge between God and his people. Okay, so a priest walks by. Then this temple assistant or the Levite, the worship leader, not quite as high a status as a priest, but still very privileged group, very respected. So the temple assistant, the Levite, walks by. So a priest and then a Levite. Well, then who comes next? Everyone listening to Jesus expects an ordinary Jew, right? You got the priest, then you have the worship temple assistant, and then you have the ordinary Jew. So when Jesus says Samaritan, everybody goes, what? It's kind of like starting the story of the three birds going, once upon a time, there was a papa bear, a mama bear, and a duck-billed platypus. <laughs> so, wait a minute, wait, that's not how the story is supposed to go. You see, Samaritans, they were despised by Jews. They'd been enemies for hundreds of years, and, and, and the racial and religious contempt, and it went both ways, between these two groups, groups was intense and often broke out in violence. And Jesus, of course, does this on purpose. By making the Samaritan the hero of the story, Jesus is saying, listen, Mr. Lawyer, you can go to church. You can be a key leader. You can be thought of by everybody as super godly, and you can still totally miss the heart of God. Don't ever get complacent. Don't ever get comfortable in your faith with God. Always be ready for the opportunities God brings you. Be ready to be His hands and feet. All right, let's keep reading verse 33. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man, and if his bill runs higher than this, I will pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three, says Jesus, which of these three would you say was the neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. And, and you kind of figure the lawyer's looking down, he's kind of angry. He can't even bring himself to say the Samaritan. He can't say those words. It's just like, okay, it's, it's the one who shall not be named. <laughs> the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now you go and do the same. Go and do the same. In other words, Jesus says, what it means to love God with all your heart and mind and soul is to be so captured by Jesus and his kingdom that when you see a need, if you're able, we're not always able, but when you see a need and God nudges you, you meet it. When I come to the place where I am interrupted, my first thought is not, how can I get rid of this person? But rather, how can I serve them? I know I'm busy, I know I don't have time, but I'm going to stop. Later on in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews 13, verse 16, puts it this way. It says, don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. Don't forget to do good and share with those in need. This is, 
it, it smells so good. It's the sacrifice that smells good to God. You see, part of God's vision for my life, for your life, is that we see ourselves as his representatives wherever we are, alert to the fact that God, that, it, that in every situation, God has placed me with this person in this moment to be his hands and feet. How? I don't know yet, but I'm going to stick around long enough to find out. You know, one reason that the early church spread like wildfire, did you know that when Jesus ascended to heaven, there, there were maybe a couple of hundred followers, and then it grew to thousands and, and then millions, and it swept the world. And one of the reasons that the early church spread like wildfire and, and grew from a persecuted handful to a dominant force in the Roman Empire is that they got famous for responding to interruptions and inconveniences. Here's an example in 185 A.D., the Antonine Plague, they think now that it was smallpox, but this plague devastated, swept through the Roman Empire. It killed between a, a quarter and a third of the population. And it was so terrifying that, that people even threw, when their family members were infected, they, they would push them out the door, throw them on the street, even before they died, to try to protect themselves from the disease. Interestingly, guess where the Christians were? Were, as everyone else is fleeing the city and throwing people out, guess what the Christians are doing? They're coming into the city and they're going through the streets and they're picking up the discards. And they cared for them either until they died or recovered. It was the early Christians who cared for the sick and the dying and the outcast and the marginalized and the nobodies. By the way, total sidebar here, but that's the origin of many, if not most, of the hospitals, that whole hospital system that we have that was started by followers of Jesus. Because we are to be a people who stop and look for God in the interruptions. Now, this is not easy, at least for me, it does not come naturally. So, how do we do that? How do we stop and look for God in the interruptions? Well, Jesus' parable here gives us four ways that we can change our thinking if we're going to be used by God in the interruptions. So four ways for us to stop for a change. All right, here's the first one. Stop and enter the risk. Stop and take a risk. Back to the Good Samaritan. So there is a reason that the priest and the, and the worship leader stayed away from the beaten man. So in this story, it's, it's the road between Jerusalem and Jericho. That's a 17-mile road. Road And guess what? That road was infested with bandits who would rob you and even kill you just for the clothes on your back. As a matter of fact, the road had a nickname. It was called the Way of Blood. Sometimes the bandits would leave one victim on the road, and when somebody stopped to help, they would attack them too. All right, so, so it's not that the, the, the priest and, and, and the worship leader were jerks. They actually had a good reason to hurry by. There was genuine risk there. And sometimes, sometimes we justify not stopping just because we're afraid of the risk or the stretch or the discomfort that might be ahead. Now listen, of course there are times when it's not, when taking a risk is not smart, all right? We're not saying be stupid for Jesus. Don't walk dangerous streets late at night. But, but let's be honest, most of us are not in danger of that, of taking too many risks. Most of us really drive the the car toward comfort. Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr. in his comment on Jesus' story here said this, he said, the first question the priest and the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? It's a good question. But the Good Samaritan reversed the question, if I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? And that's the heart of Jesus, is in every person, every situation we encounter, we're not asking what's in this for me or what do I have to put out here. We're asking, oh, okay, how does Jesus want me to love this person in this way? If I don't help this person, who will? And maybe someone will. But at least to stop and ask the question, all right? Stop and take the risk. Here's the second thing. Stop and get personally involved. Verse 34, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then the man put, put on his own donkey. He put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn where he took care of him. Listen. This was messy. This was smelly. The Samaritan gets his hands dirty in, in bandaging and cleaning up blood and putting the guy in his donkey and bringing him all the way 
to the end. And, and, and here's the thing, if we want to be part of God's work, if we want to join Him in what He's doing, we have to be willing to get personally involved. Now, this might be a no-brainer. Like, well, of course we have to get personally involved, but, but you know, too often we say, you know, somebody should do something about that. Well, I'm kind of asking, if you say somebody should do something like that, at least stop and ask the question, am I that somebody? <laughs> Am I the one that God is calling to do something about that? If, 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 am I the one who's supposed to step up? Because, because here's the thing, and this is the spiritual truth. If you notice it, assume that God has brought it to your attention for a reason. If it's right here for you, assume that God has put it in your line of sight for a reason. Why has He placed it in your path? How might He want you to respond? Pastor Joseph Tenney writes this, I think it's such insight. Interruption is God's invitation. God is inviting us to see Him all around us, in the lives of others, in our conversations, in our serving those in need. Interruption is not simply a matter of our heart developing patience. It's about experiencing true life. It is one of God's ways of waking us up to what's around us, to see there's more to be done than our self-appointed tasks for the day as important as they may seem. Stop for a change. Get personally involved. So do a little mental exercise with me. Think, think about the people in your neighborhood. Just go, just go around the block or the apartment building or whatever, wherever you live, just kind of think from house to house. Think, think about your workplace. Think about the gym where you, where you work out. What have you noticed? What have you heard? Who have you encountered? What needs are there in, 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 in the scope of, of your every day, every week schedule? How is God inviting you to join Him in the work that He is doing, already doing all around you? He invites you to stop long enough to step in and get personally involved Here's a third one. It's similar, but slightly different. Stop and take the time. <laughs> this is a big deal. Stop and take the time. There was no ER, no emergency room for the Samaritan to take this guy who got beat up. And so the Samaritan takes this enormous amount of time away from his... He was on a business trip. He had places, people to meet. He probably canceled on him and lost money on the deal. He, he took time away from business to do what was right. He, quote unquote, wasted the entire day and night. It takes time to stop and follow God's interruptions. And my guess is that this one right here is probably the one that keeps us from responding, that most keeps us from responding to God's Interruptions. We are so busy, we're so tired, we're so absorbed just to slow down and step in. And, and yet it is in precisely those moments that God uses us most powerfully. Think about your own life. Think about the people who have had the most positive impact in your life. Nearly all of them, I would guess, spent some time with you, <laughs> sacrificed some time and energy because there is a direct correlation between time spent and impact had. There's a direct correlation between time spent and impact had, and if there is ever was ever a need for time spent, it is now. A survey a couple years ago done by Cigna Health revealed these, these two facts. Nearly half of Americans, 47% of Americans, always or sometimes feel alone or left out. And just over half said they always or sometimes feel that no one knows them well. So basically what that's saying is half the people you meet every day feel alone or left out or nobody really knows who I am. Maybe you are one of those people. And in part of our calling as followers of Jesus is to step into their lives. And, and, and part of what the reason we don't is that we're too busy to take the time to, to grow relationships. And the only way, there's just one way to break out of that cycle is to intentionally stop and say, you know what, I am going to take time right now. This is important. And so I'm going to stop and I'm going to talk to this person even though I don't have the time. 
you know, one of our dreams for our building as we get ready to move in here in, in, in a few months is that we will become a place where people can actually go to stop, <laughs> where people can come and be with each other and with God, and that we can encourage one another and train one another to actually put pauses in our lives so we can slow down long enough to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and to go where He's calling us to go and to influence the, those He's calling us to influence. All right, here's a fourth way to stop. And this is a big deal. Stop and be willing to spend money. <laughs> stop and be willing to let it actually cost you something out of your wallet. Again, that, that's what the Samaritan does. Look at verse 35. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. And if his bill runs higher than this, I will pay you the next time I'm here. I said this last week, but only repeat it. One of the reasons that God gives us resources is to make a living. The other reason is to make a difference. God gives us resources, the ability to make a living so that we can also make a difference. It is the heart of God to be generous. It is the heart of God to meet needs as they arise. And so it is to become our heart as well and, say, and to pray, Lord, would you, would you show me how to be generous? Would you, would you nudge me so I can meet the needs of those you bring around me, whether they're in my church, in my neighborhood, in my school, anywhere in my sphere of influence. One of my generosity heroes is Jonathan Capri. He is the Haitian American pastor that we partner with to help Cornerstone Academy and church in rural Haiti. Jonathan has a master's degree, a master's of divinity. He's fluent in three languages. He lives in Lakeland. His day job is a teacher assistant in Polk County schools. He doesn't make a lot of money and yet he is continually putting Haitian kids through high school and college. He's continually sending money to the team in Haiti to buy rice and beans for the children and, and, and pay for medical expenses. And on a number of occasions, he actually brought a surgeon out to Cornerstone Academy out there in the sticks where there's no hospital to care for the kids and the sick and the elderly. And honestly, I have no idea how he does this stuff. God provides for them. Sometimes it's through us. We've had, we, we get the privilege of having a hand in that. But sometimes it's not through us, and I don't, I don't know how, it do it, how he does it. But, but what I love about him is that he, he lives this story that Jesus is telling. He spends his own money, and he takes enormous amounts of time. He's always on the phone with people in Haiti. He gets personally involved. He risks much, and God has used him greatly. And we get to ride on the coattails of that by partnering with him. We just we get to be part of God's work through Jonathan. Bottom line, you want God to change you and through you change others. You want God to move in you and through you. You have to get beyond your calendar and your to-do list and you're running from one thing to the next, don't just tolerate interruptions, actually embrace them. All right, the next time you're interrupted, reframe it and say, okay, what is this interruption? Is this a God moment? Now, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you actually need to focus and get your work done, okay? So not every interruption, but stop long enough to ask the question, is this interruption a, a divine appointment that God has arranged for me to meet this person right now and have this conversation with them because it is in the interruptions as you stop and embrace them that you will find that God is most alive and active and powerful. So this week, stop and pay attention to the interruptions. Stop for a change because God may be bringing these things to you for His purposes. How do you respond to this? What is your next step to stop for a change? Let's just go through those four stops again. Stop and take a risk. Where is God calling you to go, to be, that stretches you, that takes you outside your comfort zone, that feels a little scary? Maybe that's your step. Stop and get involved. That is, own it personally. Where is God calling you to actually step in? And personally, instead of just watching from afar, like, I'm going to own this. I'm going to be part of this. 
Stop and take time. What would you have to do to actually create more space in your schedule so that you could take the time to follow the nudges and the interruptions that God brings into your life? Or number four, stop and give financially. How might God be calling you to get in at our church, to get in in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your community? I don't know how, but, but what would it look like for you to stop and give? Stop for a change. And God will change you, and He'll work through you to change others. Let's pray. Father, we are all of us so busy, and we run from one thing to the next, never stopping, and usually not thinking, usually trying to avoid interruptions, and, and so I pray that you will just help us to flip that, to reverse it, and actually look for the interruptions that you might be bringing us, and, and in that moment, have the presence of mind to stop and embrace the interruption, and whether it means giving of our time or our energy, or taking a risk, or, or our finances, or whatever that means. Would you, would you give us the, the awareness to stop and enter into this, this person in, in this situation that you bring before us? Jesus, we want to be your hands and feet, and we know that you're always working, and, and so we pray that you will invite us, and you'll help us to hear your invitation in the moment. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for being here. We'll see you next time.